Hello and welcome to this week's special episode of Nerd vs World. We're all off enjoying our holidays at the moment, so instead we have our interview that we recorded at this year's MCM London with the very lovely John Noble. We talk about Fringe, Sleepy Hollow and all sorts of other stuff. Just before we get on to that, just to let you know that uh, we will be at the Nine Worlds convention uh, from the 7th to the 9th of August at the Redison Blue Edwardian. Uh, I will be taking part in the annual second annual Podcaster Games, so come along and support Nerd vs World there. Also, we'll be around over the course of the weekend doing interviews and recording footage and that kind of thing, so if you do see us, come and say hi. Also, the guys who do our Wonky Gamer podcast were at MCM Manchester over last weekend, so expect to see loads of new content coming to the site from them over the next couple of days. In the meanwhile, enjoy the interview with John Noble, and until next time, take care and be excellent to each other. Thank you, I love it. John, kicking off with a nice easy one to start with, mm. have you been enjoying yourself so far and how does it feel to be at the London Comic Con? I've had a fantastic time. I, I came uh, a couple of weeks ago to do Belfast, uh, which was great. I'd, I'd not done anything there. And um, then I I had to go up to Cambridge to give a talk, and then uh, then I went to Romania, to Bucharest, which was fantastic. It's an opening world there. And I'm so, so enchanted, actually. I had four days, and uh, my wife and I hired a car and just drove up into Transylvania. So beautiful, so beautiful. And back to Paris last weekend to... Uh, do a signing, and then this week was spent in Dusseldorf, and now here. So it's good to be back. Old territory. And when people do get to meet you at events like this, mm. what are the most common questions people ask you? What are the stuff that people want to chat to you about? Predominantly, um, people are fascinated by Fringe, still. Mm. Mm, absolutely. And Fringe has had a rebirth, a complete rebirth of late because of the Netflix Whereas it was a moderately successful show, you know, it ran five seasons, with, with a really fine fan base, it's now out of control because of this, the, the new releases on Netflix. I mean, seriously, out of control. <laughs> Ten times popular, more popular than it ever was. So that's, that's the main one. Also, Walter Bishop was such a, an interesting character, I think. Denethor comes into it a bit, I must admit. I don't know, is the Sleepy Hollow been here yet? Yeah we're, yeah, we're getting to see we like that. But I tell you what, let's, let's start with Fringe, because like you say, the show is continually getting bigger and bigger, even after its yes, conclusion. Um, what for you is the, the magic of the show? What was it about the show that made you want to be a part of it right from the get-go? Well, okay, I mean, to start with, Walter Bishop was, was a character that you, if you had a dream of a perfect character to play as a character actor, you'd say, give me Walter Bishop. And I was very, very fortunate that the, the writers also went with me and I went with them. So that when they realised that I was basically up for anything, they kept giving me anything, and then I would invent something else, and, and so it went. I finished up playing about 14 versions of, of him eventually. It was a total joy. But the main thing that, that worked, apart from the very interesting science, which, which we, we always tried to keep within the realms, the possibilities of theoretical physics, believe it or not, that was my request to the writers. Please at least make it feasible that we can go there. Uh, so if they came up with an experiment that was just rubbish, I'd say, oh, no, please don't make me do that because the fans will know and I know and it's not so good. And they did. They were fantastic. A couple, couple of the first season were a bit dodgy, uh, but it was mainly the, uh, the relationships, the relationship between Walter and his son, uh, between Anna Torf's character, um, just seeking a call. I mean, it's just this incredible bond that, that was built up over time. And that, I know from talking to people, is, is what they found enchanting. And it was fascinating. For the first time, people would come up, this is the only show that we could ever watch as a family. I thought, geez, that's a lovely thing to say about a show, isn't it? And uh, so that the, the fan group was all ages, all, both genders right across the board. And families would watch together. I think it's a pretty fantastic thing in this day and age. Is um, physics something you're interested yeah. in yourself? Mm -hmm, very much so. Um, I'm not a scientist. Mm but I have a, a deep and abiding passion for it, and particularly uh, um, the th theoretical side, you know, the future. It, it, I'm spellbound by the possibilities that are, that are being revealed all the time. And I don't have to be a scientist. I mean, there's some fantastic literature around, which is quite dense, but you don't have to understand pure maths to do it. And so that's 
probably my main reading, I suspect. Fascinating stuff. You say you guys suggested a lot of stuff for Walter Bishop to the writers. How, how much creative control did you have over the character? What what I have um, over the character was interpretation. Uh, with television, you don't change dialogue, and I wouldn't. Uh, simple reason is by the time we get it, it's gone through so many channels and so many filters that if I wanted to change something, then it would have to go back through those back through those cycles again. And so I never did that, but they, uh, uh, they allowed me to interpret and to improvise a lot within the context. So that was a dream. Going to work was a dream for me, and it was always fun, <laughs> you know, such crazy things. Just the way to deliver a line sometimes would be just such fun. And I'd be thinking, how on earth do I, do I deliver that? And I'd be sitting, sitting, and suddenly it would come to me in, the, in a taxi or something. I'd like, that's it. It was bizarre, out of left field, but it was the right one. Thing behind Walter's fascination with food. Oh my God! <laughs> yeah, he's. <laughs> no, not really. But I, I had to go with it. It, it. it was. It was one of those quirks that that became very much a Walterism, and it's it's consistent with the obsessiveness, you know, and uh, he's a fairly addictive personality as well. So that was consistent. Uh, and, and there were other quirks as well, the fact that he could never get Astrid's name right until the <laughs> finale, you know, and that was such a beautiful thing to play over five years, trying to think of new names for it. She <laughs> would all have the scratch in her head, say, what? And she'd say, why don't you call me that? And said, <laughs> so it went on until the final, I think it was the final episode where I said, Astrid, that's a beautiful name. And she cried. Such a sweetheart. I mean, like you said, it's a show that was all about the relationships. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit, particularly, I guess, about working with Joshua and mm -hmm. Anna um, mm -hmm. and the various iterations of that relationship over the course of the series? Oh, absolutely. Uh, I know that JJ, at the time that he he was putting this together, and when he met with um, <clears throat> Alex Gertzman and uh, Roberto Orci, they said, we want to write an important show about a father-son because it hadn't been done. And so they built this, this thing in. Uh, working with Joshua and I really clicked at, at all levels. And in fact, I think of him as a son, really. Um, and we just played. We always had the best relationship going. And we could play the, the tensions and all the tensions and all the joys very easily for us. Anna was such a hard woman in the beginning, so locked in. I don't know if you remember the early seasons of it. Um, and it was, she was really liberated when we went to the alternate universe. And, and everyone realised what a superb actress she is. And they're going, oh my God, she's not the stitched up person in grey. She's this fabulous, uh, sexy lady. And she enjoyed that very much. And then the relationship between... I mean, I'm also extremely fond of Anna and uh, a fellow Australian. And so that was pretty easy to play, <laughs> to be honest. But none of these things happened overnight. There were slow builds and ups and downs, and we even did uh, uh, some shows where, uh, beginning of season four perhaps, where Joshua wasn't in the timeline. So I had to play Walter without a Joshua, and that was very tricky, because there was nothing redeeming. He was, so I, I, I sort of made him this obsessive compulsive character who was rescued because of his scientific knowledge, but nothing else, and he was still quite ill and distracted. I'm glad that finished. That was really hard to do. So when Josh finally came back, yay! <laughs> and like you said, obviously there were, there were many different versions of Walter, mm. but I think the, the primary two were our Walter and Walter. Yes. Um, which of those two versions did you identify with the most, and what elements of yourself uh, both, did you see both? Both. Mm. Both. It's uh, it's like uh, sliding doors, isn't it? You know, what happens in our life to take us in one direction or another. It was the same man with all of the same characteristics, the same level of intelligence, the same looks, but one went a certain path and finished up because of his work being put into a mental asylum and basically reduced to, to shambles. And the other one was put in a position of authority and therefore went on to became, become a state leader. Both the same men. And my favourite scene, possibly, of, maybe my favourite scene, you may recall, it was when the two of them finally got down to sit and have a talk to each other. And I still... I, I'd always wanted that to happen. Then they shot this beautiful scene of just the two of us sitting in a corridor talking to each other intimately about something. Oh, such a joy to do. So. And obviously, I mean, you mentioned that um, 
some wonderful um, physics and science. Mm. Uh, I'm curious, looking back, what were the most fun things to play with? Because obviously there's a lot of special effects and a lot of practical effects as well on the mm. series. I think the, the most radical thing we did was, was the alternate universe, mm. um, which, as you probably know, is incredibly feasible. Yeah. Um, and so it w wasn't too much of a stretch in, in theory. And, and it's funny, I had a, a, a friend who was a scientist, is a scientist, sorry, when I was at university, and I shared a flat with him, and he's crazy. He's truly crazy. And I based Walter Bishop largely on him, to be honest with you. <laughs> but we would sit down sometimes at night, and we would, just, we would work then on the laws of probabilities, that there must be, simply by the laws of probabilities, for example, an, an exact duplicate of what we are here. There must be, in, in, a, in a term. And so that, that, these sorts of thoughts have been with me for a very long time. And that my friend is still a crazy scientist and still fighting the establishment every chance he gets. When you were first pitched the idea of the show, did you, did you know that it was going to turn into that kind of sprawling parallel universe tale? No, not at all. No, I think what happens with the show is, is that they really need to reboot each year. And, and, and I think all television series do that, unless it's just a straight procedural, like... Um, Special Victims Unit or something, then that is a straight procedural which, which very successfully goes. But with these types of shows, they really need to reboot, find another way. And uh, that's what they had to do on well, four occasions after the opening. So you don't really know. Uh, they, they also listen quite closely now to what the fans say, what, what works for the fans. And there were ideas for anyone observing that came in and just disappeared, like, where did that go? <laughs> it just disappeared because it wasn't holding wasn't progressing us. I wonder if there are any ideas that you would have liked to have seen in the show that never quite made it in? No, not really. I think uh, the glorious thing about Fringe was we, we were able, we were given a fifth season, limited fifth season, and uh, Fox said it was to finish the story. And uh, I mean, the choice then was what was projected into the future, and we tried to tie up a lot of loose ends in that 13 episode arc. That was very, you know how there's the reputation of people closing shows? in the middle of it, and I was really thrilled that they did that. Mm. Uh, whether it was satisfactory to the fans, I don't know, but at least we finalised a lot of those story arcs that went through. Uh, look, th th there's a lot of people would love to see Fringe again, mm. seriously. I don't, I, don't know whether re I don't know whether Reboot would be. I know that it would, to me it would be essential to have at least four of the central characters back. Um, that being Joshua's character, Anna's character, Jessica's character, my character. And then, you know, some wonderful characters as well, like Blair Browns and, uh, and Lance Reddick. So I don't know. I don't know what they'd do. So if um, JJ was to phone you up and say, I'm getting the band back together, um, would you... I'd be the first to sign on. Seriously. I mean, it all, it all depends on availability. Um, I mean, I know Josh is doing another show at present. I'm going back to do another show. Um, and is doing a film at present, so it's kind of not always as easy as it sounds, if, unless you're all unemployed <laughs> actors, <laughs> which could happen easily. We just got lucky. I mean, obviously, talking about where the show did leave off, mm. um, how did you feel about particularly that final episode? Um, mm -hmm. how, how did that sit with you? Well, it, it almost had to be that. It almost had to be that. We couldn't diminish Walter, and we didn't know what to do with him, so what we did was projected him into a world where he would be comfortable. And uh, and that made sense of the whole observer track through the thing as well, played by the brilliant Michael Cerveris. He's another one I would definitely want back in. Whether we'll get him or not, he's just been nominated for another Tony Award on Broadway, so we may not get him. He's the nicest man and he's brilliant. Uh, and the, 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 the father-son going back to their child, which had been raised. You can't leave, I don't think you can leave things like that open-ended. I think you need to go back and sort them out. And we lost a few people in the way. We, we killed off a Blair. And yeah. <laughs> 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 so, um, um, mm. Transitioning over, um, because we don't have that much time, mm. um, what, what was the, the, the transition, transition from Walter to your character of um, the, the... Henry Parrish. Yeah, yeah. Henry Parrish and the... Mm. Horseman of War. Mm. The, well, the Horseman of War was a surprise to me, to be honest with you. When uh, Alex Kurtzman rang me about that role, he, he painted this wonderful picture of this duplicitous fellow who just appears to be a nice old guy, <laughs> but he has this incredible subtext running through it. 
And I loved that season one. It was so gorgeous because all the way through, I was planting little clues, but no one knew. And even the other actors forgot <laughs> what was going on. And until I remember Tom Meissen saying to me at the end, he said, God, I forgot you were going to do that. <laughs> because he was this nice old fellow that was helping him out. It was a gorgeous play. The first season was a gorgeous play. Second season lost its way a bit. Third season is about to be... A, there's a reboot happened. I don't know what it is because I'm not involved. I'm out of the show now. Um, but I, I, I suspect it's very good. But it will, it will focus on the two leads. And uh, I'm gone. Um, catch, is, catch is gone. Uh, Orlando... Um, Anyway, the three of us, three or four of us are gone, <laughs> history. And uh, so they'll go back to what they believe is the core of it, which is the relationship between Nicole and Tom. That's what they believe. The wonderful girl called Lindy Greenwood, I think, is going to stay there as well. She's a fantastic girl, a wonderful actor too. The rest of us are history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've, I've got it on DVR. I haven't seen it, so I don't... I'll say, <laughs> I'll say no more about my gory death. But, um, um, again, would you, would you go back to the show if they asked you to? I, I did. Uh, uh, Alex spoke to me earlier and said, look, if he could work it, could, would I come back as, as a guest? And I said, yes, in theory, but I don't think I'll be able to because I'm actually going back to work for another network. So <laughs> it's not going to be that easy, not this year anyway. A victim of your own success. Uh, I mean, obviously, you've had an incredible fortune to work with great people mm, in front of the camera, but mm, as well behind... Yes, uh, yes. Peter Jackson, J.J. Yep. Abrams. Can you mm. talk a little bit, I guess, particularly about both of them and, and what distinguishes them in your mind as directors? Mm. They, there's a similarity. Mm. There's a similarity between the two of them. I just want to make mention, by the way, that we've just lost Andrew Lesney, who's the, the DOP, on All the Rings. Just, just the nice and a genius. And a genius. And what we see out there on those screens is his creation. And I'm hurt by that. He's only he was 58. Anyway, um, both of them are incredibly enthusiastic, almost childlike in their enthusiasm. These men, obviously they're brilliant, and they have the ability to inspire other people. Jackson, I noticed, when he did, when he did Rings, I, I couldn't believe going to New Zealand and, and seeing that, that everyone there was working at their optimum and that the bar was up here and everyone went for it. I mean, everyone. Nobody... There was no negativity at all on that set, and everyone was just going for the best that ever done, and that showed in the movies. I mean, actors, costume, everything was that. And then JJ just has this extraordinary, again, it, it appears almost childlike, but believe me, it's not. This imagination that flies so fast. To talk to JJ, you have to really be on your toes, because he's very sharp and pretty enthusiastic, he talks very fast, and you go, whoa, oh, slow down, slow down. But I like both of the men very much indeed. Is there a role um, that you feel that you haven't got to play yet? Maybe a classic role or just a type of character you haven't got in, uh, the chance to Yeah, well, prob with. probably the role, I, I, it's nothing to do with film and television. Mm. I probably will do King Lear one day because mm. from the time that a young actor goes in, he says, one day, one day I'll be, one day I'll be yeah. good enough if I'm not too old. And that's the problem. It's really demanding. You. You've got to be old, really old to yeah. do it. Uh, but well, I think that's all the case. Yeah. No, it's not Is the same. as. Well, Hamlet, Hamlet is for the younger men, and, and then you've got uh, Juliet, who's an amazing role for a 15-year-old. Yeah. These are very tough things to do. Anyway, that's not what we're here to talk about. But that's, probably, that's probably what I would do. <laughs> oh, it even it makes me shiver to think of it because it's so hard. I went back and read it again a couple of years ago, and I said, why do you let this go, John? It's so hard. But having just gone back to stage and done a couple of things, I'm, I'll go. Are you free to discuss your new project? No. Uh, I hoped I would be today, and... Uh, then I got a letter from my uh, what a text, email even, from my agent saying, "Sorry, they haven't. They wanted to release it and hasn't been released yet. She's going to contact me later today. We'll see. Mm -hmm. I can't obviously." Can you tell us what genre it's in at least? Mm, I think Sherlock Holmes. Okay. I think I mean in terms of um, excitement and rumours. Uh, obviously, when JJ was announced that he was going to be taking over the Star Wars universe, mm. your name was first in a lot of people's <laughs> suggestions of someone who was going to potentially feature mm. in that. Mm. Was that just fan speculation, or was there, was there ever any discussion about that? Is that something you'd even be interested in if it ever came up? Yeah, I'd be interested for sure. I mean, as a franchise, that's maybe the greatest franchise. Um, and if, 
if you were, um, or what, what would you choose to be? Um, well, what uh, would you like to be in, mm, in the Star Wars mythos? I don't know. I mean, if the, the rumours, I think Harrison Ford played the role I would play, and that's pretty good casting, frankly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I have no hard feelings about that. It would be something of this stature, I think. I'd, I usually play characters of fair stature because of my size and my voice, so don't mind playing baddies. <laughs> All goodies. What, good what Thank you. draws you to a character? What, what? Complexity, simply complexity. I don't. I have no interest, and I, I, I don't think I'm very good at playing two-dimensional characters. And when <laughs> I used to say to my agents, please don't send me for two-dimensional... I'm actually really bad at them. There's lots of actors who can do this much better than I'm, I get very self-conscious about playing two-dimensional characters. So. Thank you very much. Good to talk to you all. Thanks for being here.